Emerging Internet Technologies, here to talk to you about our work in uh, creating AJAX tooling, primarily around Mozilla. I know that's what, I think that's what folks here are interested in. Uh, so I'm gonna ask for you guys to interrupt me anytime with questions, let me know if I'm covering the right content, something you wanna hear more or less of. Um, I'm just gonna start out with some context of where IBM um, is uh, getting involved in AJAX, a little bit about the open AJAX industry consortium, a little bit about our project, and then we'll dig into some of the technical details of how we use Mozilla. And then we can talk about where we think uh, things are going and how to help. It's all happening in open source. So IBM's vision with Ajax, um, pretty simple really. I mean, uh, before even before it was called Ajax, um, IBM was very excited about the potential uh, particularly for our customers, to have these rich clients running with such a uh, low cost of ownership, for virtually zero, right? And the fact that uh, with Ajax and all the buzz and the open source collaboration, uh, this technology is finally becoming real uh, and uh, getting up to the level of traditional fat clients. So we want to grow adoption um, both in the development um, tools to make it easier faster to develop, applications of better quality. Um, also through open source, we think that's the right way to do it because there's a lot of cross-pollination going on between these uh, open source efforts. And um, maybe too much right now, there's uh, the Ajax toolkits probably number in the hundreds, but um, we see that over time there being consolidation. And, um, um, and there are many, many benefits right now to having all that uh, development going on. So there are a lot of companies that, that share this, uh, this vision, and uh, we formed a consortium we call Open Ajax. Uh, this was back in February. And uh, the group is, is uh, looking to um, primarily make a statement that uh, Ajax is becoming real uh, and tell customers that uh, all these names, these big names in the industry are behind it. And uh, Open Ajax itself, it's not a technology, there's no code per se, called Open Ajax. It's, it's an industry movement. Each of these companies does have code. Um, many of them are contributing to the open source. And I'll talk a little bit about what IBM is, has contributed to Open Ajax. Um, so one of the main goals uh, of the Open Ajax consortium is to address what's missing to make Ajax real in the enterprise and elsewhere. <laughs> And this is just a short list of some of the things we hear most frequently. Tooling needs work. Um, it's, there's some tooling, it's scattered, it's not well integrated. It's not, certainly not of the same quality as traditional development tools. Um, there's very little in the way of accessibility. Uh, screen readers often don't know what to make out of an AJAX application. Um, security, uh, you know, a lot of angles there, of course. You're in the browser, that gives you a sandbox, but there are a lot of ways you can still abuse that. And if nothing else, we need guidelines, if not uh, actual code to back that up. Um, internationalization, localization, just now starting to appear in the toolkits. A lot of enterprises need that before they can even think about adopting a framework. Um, and around reliability, well, you know, do what we can for reliability, certainly, on the core platform, but uh, where you can't, certainly, uh, be able to log and find out where the problems are. Uh, that kind of thing is very important. And then the kind of higher level concepts, a little bit fuzzier, like, uh, you know, do we need declarative grammars and what should they look like? Um, and what kind of data model? JSON's a great start, but, you know, how do you bind that to your controls and, and have higher level abstractions around your data in interacting with the server in intelligent ways? Um, the AJAX Toolkit Framework that Javier and I have been working on um, seeks to provide an integrated tooling environment that we've built in Eclipse. And um, you'll see the architecture chart here and shows a Eclipse workbench. We build on top of something called Eclipse Web Tools, which provides basic support for deploying web apps, um, HTML editors, and, and the like, but it still uh, doesn't go too far with JavaScript. So we've added a lot around JavaScript technology. We've integrated with Mozilla to render and test the applications. And again, trying to, seeking to provide the 
base tooling needed in open source and encouraging others to join in and, and uh, build on top of that. And here's a slightly more detailed chart of, of uh, the pieces that we're building. Uh, the golden pieces are, are external pieces that we're reusing. Um, and again, it kind of breaks down to two pieces. There's the JavaScript kind of DHTML world. We have uh, JavaScript debugger, DOM inspector, some familiar tools, JavaScript syntax validator to catch errors, um, typos, things like that. On the right-hand side uh, is what we call personalities, and this is our abstraction for AJAX toolkits, just to make them a little bit easier to deal with. Um, right now, we support three, um, Dojo, Zimbra, and, and Rico. Uh, which isn't on this slide, but it's a pluggable system. Um, we've pulled out all the common pieces we can into a library, and there's a template-driven, uh, a, a wizard-driven builder that can easily enable new toolkits to come along and plug in, in here. So again, this just kind of breaks down what I discussed. Uh, some of the pieces we leverage from web tools, some we leverage from Mozilla. And we chose Mozilla not for its proprietary abilities as a, as a development platform with Zool or anything like that, but as a, a good standards-driven portable browser base. Because we really, at least uh, the initial thought was to get people to develop cross-platform, cross-browser code. And Mozilla was just the easiest way for us to tool that. It's open source. We, we know it's in there. We can hook it. We can, we can uh, instantly get uh, support on more than one platform. This isn't to say we can't support other browsers as well. And I talked a little bit about the personalities. Um, I'll give you a quick demo of what it looks like. So here's the Eclipse Workbench. Um, I don't know how many of you are Eclipse users, but um, on the left-hand side is a list of projects and the content within each project. Um, here I have a project for the uh, Dojo Toolkit. And this was created by a wizard, which did all the work for me of setting up the directory structure, injecting the, the assets, the JavaScript code, and there's a fair amount of it here. And you really don't have to worry about any of that. It does all that for you. And if you want to create a new page in Dojo, you just use a wizard. So here we go. I want to make a new Dojo application, which is really just an HTML page after all, so I'll uh, give it a name. And here it made a directory in my, to be deployed to my web server. It's an HTML file and built off a template. It just includes all the standard pieces you need to include the libraries and uh, just an empty shell of a page. I'm going to throw some content in there. Um, on the right-hand side, you see some Eclipse snippets. This is just another feature we've started out with in our personalities. I can select Dojo and see some snippets that I can drag and drop right into my app. So I'll take a tree widget. And Dojo's kind of nice. It's got a declarative markup for declaring its widgets. And here, whoops, there's a tree with some nodes inside of it. I also need a, it's kind of like the equivalent of an import. I need to import all the JavaScript code, right? drag and drop. Let me try that again. I need to bring in Dojo widget tree as the class. I'll save this. And by integrating with web tools, here's a nice thing to actually see the app run. Just one click to run into Mozilla. And what happens is it copies all the code to a Tomcat server, starts up the server, and then opens the content in an embedded Mozilla browser. So you know, traditionally that could be a very tedious manual process, and we're trying to shorten the, the development time. There's the app, there's my tree. Okay. And we'll talk a little bit more later about the details of embedding Mozilla, but we can do some really exciting things here um, because it's embedded um, not just graphically, but um, Eclipse knows how to reach into the uh, browser internals. So I can do things like we, we made a DOM inspector, kind of like you see in Mozilla, right? This is an Eclipse widget talking to the browser. You can see all the pieces, properties. Uh, we also implemented a JavaScript console, so I can see all the messages getting passed. Um, and it's integrated graphically all, all in one workbench. I can, 
I found it really helpful to have it all in one place operating off of one model. I'll go to a slightly more complicated example. We made a, a store prototype using the Zimbra framework. Now, it's now known as uh, the Apache Kabuki. And if I go to the, that HTML page, I'm going to do the same thing, except I'm going to use debug launch to launch it in Mozilla. So again, copied all of this code to the server, launched it in Mozilla browser, and let me see if I can make that a little bigger. So I've got this grid of, of servers we sell, and as I click on each one of them, it will make a server request using an XML HTTP request in my demo here, pull back some data, and populate it down here in the panel below. So um, what I've done is I've set a breakpoint in that routine so I can demonstrate our JavaScript line debugger. So let me click on the iSeries 520. So here's a debugger, kind of like Venkman, for those of you familiar with Venkman, integrated into the Eclipse world. Um, you'll see a call stack, local variables. I can click on different parts of the call stack, see the code. And at the same time, I still have the browser available. I still have the DOM inspector, JavaScript console, all these pieces are, are running. Um, and there's one other piece I'll show you, the XHR monitor. That's uh, short for XML HTTP request. Um, I'm going to let this code continue, go off and make the request to the server. And uh, you'll see that iSeries 520 it did what it was supposed to do, populated some data. But uh, I want to see that request. We, we have this widget that listens on the wire. And here you'll see the post, HTTP post to the servlet. Uh, for those of you who've seen Firebug, that's something similar to what Firebug does. I got request response headers, and, and you can even see the body of the message. So again, nice to have it all integrated in one place. We've added a couple new things, too, like uh, syntax checking. We'll go back to the source view. So here's my application. If I were to just introduce a stray character, which is so easy to do, right? Usually I would have to wait for a full deployment cycle to see that error, and only then if I'm lucky because JavaScript being interpreted, I'd, I'd need a test that, that exercises that particular line of code. Here, um, as you type, we run the code through a syntax checker, it gets flagged immediately. We're using the Rhino parser in this example. We also use uh, JS Lint uh, from, uh, what's his name, Douglas Craw Crawford or something like that. It's a public domain utility, and uh, here if I take out a semicolon, that'll run, that's valid, but JSLint flags it and suggests that you add a semicolon. So just another example of the kinds of things we can accomplish fairly easily in Eclipse and uh, add value to this, this workbench. But by being part of the workbench, it goes beyond just HTML and web development. Um, I can use any other Eclipse plugins available. I might be doing my servlet uh, development, uh, Java or PHP or any number of other things, or web services, anything else that Eclipse provides, uh, deploying and debugging them here in the same workspace. So that's kind of nice. Um, for those of you here, I don't know how many of you have tried to install ATF. Uh, some of the feedback we've gotten is that it ha hasn't been the most pleasant experience. I'm here to take the arrows for the team. Um, we, we are very high on the Eclipse food chain. We have many dependencies, and those dependencies percolate down. We are learning how to build things in the Eclipse update system. The Eclipse update system still has its own kinks to be worked out, so um, there are a lot of places things can go wrong. Um, but we, we are providing support uh, for, for the early users, and if you post, well, the AlphaWorks forum's down at the moment, but if you post to our news group, or contact, contact us, we will help you get it running. We would really love to get the feedback. Um, but the Eclipse update's kind of interesting. Uh, we, we provide our code as a zip, but it pulls in pieces like the Mozilla integration, which we put back to Mozilla.org, gets downloaded directly from Mozilla.org. Zimbra comes from zimbra.com, and it pulls all the pieces together. So when it works, it's a, it's a beautiful thing. It's very extensible. And you also need uh, a special version of Mozilla called Zoolrunner, which we'll talk about later. So you, you saw, I, I think, what we're calling our 1.0 um, release. It's, it's out on uh, Eclipse now in CVS. The source is available. It's part of the web tool 
web tooling project. Um, and here are some of the there are some of the shortcomings and some of the things we would like to try doing in the future. Um, the JavaScript editor is very basic. We would like to see it improved, both uh, through some of the work we're doing and from third-party contributions. We we welcome uh, contributions to the project, of course. Our goal is to be more like the JDT, which eclipses uh, Java development, where you can fully model the code, rename, refactor all over the place. It's, it's really nice. We would love to be able to see that happen in JavaScript someday, uh, and uh, including more object-oriented um, support of JavaScript, because that's becoming so popular now. Visual editing in Ajax toolkits certainly on our wish list. Um, and uh, more features around personality integration, like uh, uh, build processes that may go with them, um, code assist, and some of the other things we talked about earlier. At this point, uh, I'm going to hand it over to Javier, who's going to talk a little bit about the Mozilla integration and some of the technical details there. Afternoon. Um, so while Adam has been mostly working with Eclipse and trying to get ATF up and running, uh, what I've been doing is trying to get Mozilla to work inside of Java, to work inside of Eclipse, to work with SWT. Um, so our main thing was to try, try to embed Mozilla, the Mozilla browser inside an SWT widget. Uh, there already exists something uh, out there on Linux. Linux, uh, SW, since SWT is a platform specific layer. On Linux, it embeds Mozilla, uh, whereas on other platforms, it embeds what's considered the platform browser. On, on Windows, it embeds, embeds IE. On Mac, it embeds Safari. Uh, but we took the code that's out there for SWT to embed Mozilla, and we tried to expand on it. Um, one of the main problems with the existing code is that it's very kind of static. Uh, it's based directly on creating JNI wrappers for each interface in Mozilla. Um, the problem that this has is that as we get new releases of Mozilla, you have to create new wrappers for any new interfaces that have shown up. Um, things may change along the way, so you have to add support for that. Uh, it's based specifically on GCC, on the GCC compiler, so if you would like to get this working on other platforms, you have to kind of tweak things around um, and then rebuild, and then if you want to deploy it, you'd have to deploy a JNI library for every platform, which isn't ideal. Um, so what we worked on is we actually created a what we call Java XPCOM, uh, which is basically Java bindings for Mozilla. And we use those to embed, to create the SWT wrapper. Uh, that way the, uh, I mean the embed in SWT. Uh, so that way the SWT widget itself is straight Java. It has, doesn't have to worry about what platform it's running in. Uh, it just uses the Java bindings and the actual platform specific stuff is handled by Mozilla. And when you release Mozilla, it, it, come, it, it would come with the Java wrappers and you would create something that's nice and portable. You wouldn't have to worry about shipping uh, platform specific libraries and so on. The other thing that that afforded us when uh, we were uh, working inside ATF, inside the uh, Ajax Toolkit Framework, is it allowed us to work uh, directly with some of the things that uh, are provided by Mozilla, specifically XBCOM. Um, it allowed us, as Adam already showed you, uh, to work with uh, the DOM inspector, to work directly with the DOM APIs to get access to those features and to even manipulate them on the fly. Uh, the XML HTTP request uh, monitor, the JavaScript console, and the debugger. Those are all things that at the moment are specific to our Mozilla support. In the future for ATF, we'll expand that to include other browsers, but for now it's, it's very much Mozilla specific. Um, the other thing, the last thing I, I, I wanted to point out here is as Adam mentioned, we use Zool Runner, which is the current embedding framework for Mozilla. In the future, Firefox, Thunderbird, what have you, uh, will all be based on top of this Zool Runner layer. Um, and that's what we ship with, and currently it ships with the Java XPCOM libraries, the, the Java bindings, which I'll get into a little bit later. Um, so I've talked a little bit about uh, XPCOM, and some of you may not be aware of what it is. It's uh, Mozilla's answer to a cross-platform 
component object model. It's kind of similar to Microsoft's COM. Uh, it allows you to break your code up into separate components. Uh, it allows for discover registering and discovery of these components by other components. Um, everything is done with the interfaces. Um, so when you're when one XBCOM component is talking to another, it doesn't have to worry about how it was implemented, in which language it was implemented. As long as it adheres to the registered interfaces, everything works out fine. It uses uh, all the interfaces are declared with uh, uh, using XPIDL, which if you're familiar with IDL language, it's very similar. It's a uh, language independent description language. Uh, but XPIDL does some Mozilla specific tweaks here and there. So they're not completely compatible. Um, and the base interface for all XPCOM interfaces is called NSI supports. And the three basic functions it supports here are uh, the query interface, which allows runtime type discovery. So you can, if you have an object, you can query what interface that object supports. Uh, and it also handles the object lifetime through reference counting. So for Java XPCOM, we we latched on to, uh, we, we piggybacked on some of the, the features that XPCOM supports in order to reflect the XPCOM interfaces into Java. So all the public interfaces that are available uh, with, uh, written in XPIDL, those are now available as Java interfaces. So you can use your Java program to directly work with XPCOM objects. To allow communication back and forth between XPCOM and Java, you can pass XPCOM objects to Java and vice versa. Um, this is something that we that IBM worked on, and it currently ships with uh, Zool Runner, the first release of Zool which is 1.8.0.1 at the moment. Um, the other thing we worked uh, on, as Adam mentioned earlier, is to make these Java, the the Java interfaces themselves, available as a jar to be downloaded by the Eclipse update. So if your app, if you create an Eclipse app and it requires these libraries, it's very easy to set up your update mechanism to pull in the Mozilla libraries, uh, same with uh, the Rhino libraries. Uh, so I'm here to get a little technical on, on to how uh, Java XPCOM does its thing. Uh, XPCOM provides a language binding facility called XPT Call. It was originally created to, to, uh, to work with JavaScript, to allow JavaScript to work with C++ and to have objects reflected back and forth between those. Uh, it does two things. It allows you to invoke a, a given method on any XPCOM interface, and it allows you to basically impersonate, dynamically impersonate a, an XPCOM interface. So in our case, a Java class that implements an XPCOM interface, that object can be passed on to any other uh, XPCOM interface. And just because it implements the interface, they'll be able to communicate just fine back and forth. The last piece that it requires is the uh, NS Interface Info Manager. All the libraries, all the interfaces that are defined in XPIDL are made available through the NSI, NSI Interface Info Manager, so you can query information uh, on that class. You can, you can find out uh, what methods it has, what parameters it takes, what are its parent interfaces, and so on. So we use that to, that's one of the things that we use to uh, first to generate the Java interfaces and also when we're marshalling uh, parameters back and forth between, uh, for example, if uh, my Java app, my Java class is calling an XPCOM method that happens to be written in C++, I have to change, I have to wrap any Java objects that are getting passed uh, to C++ in something that C++ won't understand. And we use the NS Interface Info Manager to find out what uh, parameters that method would take, what kind they are, Yeah, this is, uh, using all three of these things, the, well, using XPT call and the NS Interface Info Manager, we can create the proxies, as I mentioned. Uh, but it's flexible enough. As I mentioned, it was originally done for JavaScript. Uh, I use it to, to create the Java bindings, but it's flexible enough that others have already done similar things for Python, uh, C Sharp, Ruby, and this can be used for pretty much any other language. Uh, so the things that we use Java XPCOM for, the, the Java bindings, is embedding, obviously, as you saw from, 
from Adam, we embed it inside an SWT widget uh, and we make use of, uh, by calling directly to uh, Mozilla and doing stuff like the DOM inspector. Um, another thing that we've been working on is a component loader. Uh, as I mentioned, XPCOM is all about breaking up your code into components. And for the most part, if you were to download Firefox 1.5 right now, you could write your components in two languages right now, C++ or JavaScript. Uh, I created a Java component loader, which allows you to also create your components in Java. Uh, this has been a pretty requested feature once uh, Java XPCOM was announced. Uh, and it works out pretty well. And one of the th things that I used the component loader to create is an RMI server extension for Firefox. Uh, the reason that we wanted to do this was that it would one of the deficiencies of, of how of, uh, of debugging inside uh, ATF is that you have to use the embedded browser and some people don't really want to do that. They want to see it running on the actual um, the actual running Firefox instance. Um, it's either just to see what it would look like on a user's desktop or also to debug um, the UI for Firefox which is also written in, in, uh, in JavaScript. Um, the other thing that an RMI server extension would allow is to not only debugging a Firefox instance on your system, but through RMI debugging a remote Firefox instance. If you, if you want to debug a problem that was happening on some user system, as long as there's a network between them, you should be able to use RMI to make that communication work. Um, so I actually have a little demo to give for Java XPCOM, so. Uh, so here I'll start up a debug version of Firefox 1.5. Don't have network access right now. Um, so the first thing I'll do is I'll show you uh, some, of the, uh, some of the things you can do with the Java XPCOM and the Java Component Loader. So this is a simple uh, web page which has JavaScript on it. And when I load it, um, this is the Java Component Loader dynamically loading and generating Java interface files for XPCOM interfaces. Uh, it's not very exciting in and of itself. Uh, right here, this is it talking to the Java uh, component. So if you take a look at the source, um, you can see the real power here of, of what we can accomplish with Java XPCOM. And this is simply JavaScript uh, saying it wants the implementation, the, an, an object of, of type Java loader sample, uh, and it wants to create an instance. And then it just gets the interface based on NSI sample. JavaScript has no idea how that component is written. It can be written C++, it can be another JavaScript component. In this case, it's Java. It doesn't care. All it cares about is that it works with, uh, with this NSI sample interface, and then it can call all these get, set, and poke methods that it wants. Then over here, we just have a simple RMI server. This is a similar thing. It's just JavaScript. It's just JavaScript calling that object and also based on the NSI sample. Well, actually, this one I didn't need an interface. I haven't worked out all the kinks here, and this is all brand new stuff here that I'm showing you, so you're the first to see it. I know, you're all excited. <laughs> so what I can do now is I have here a simple uh, client. Uh, the Java, R the RMI server is running on Firefox right now, and all this does first is Look up, look up that instance in the local registry, in the local host registry, uh, gets the service manager, which is a Mozilla uh, thing which we can get, we can query uh, components. Uh, then it just tries to get the frontmost window and then open up an alert on it. It's all very simple, so I can run that here from within, um, from within Eclipse, I'll run my client and it'll talk through RMI to the running Firefox, so just press play, and bam, there it is. It opened up a, an alert on the running Firefox. So like I said, this is, all, this is just something that I got working a couple days ago, so we haven't really done much with it. Uh, the hope is that we could get this working with the JavaScript debugger uh, eventually to be able to do remote debugging, as we said, um, or anything else, actually, for that matter. Um, so that's what I have, that's my demo, and now Adam was going to go more in depth into the debugger.
back? Okay. Okay, so based on what Javier has done, we were able to build um, all these tools um, talking from Java over the XPCOM bridge to Mozilla. You saw them in the demo. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about how we accomplish the traditional debugger. As uh, many of you know, uh, you know, Bankman is considered pretty much state of the art when it comes to JavaScript debugging. Bankman is itself a Zool application. Like most Zool applications, that means it's mostly JavaScript. Um, and what it's doing is it's making calls to an uh, API called JSD, and those are basically uh, C-level routines wrapped in XPCOM. Um, that go right to the JavaScript engine, uh, and it's a pretty low-level debugging API, um, and it uses XP Connect, which, if I'm not mistaken, Javier, is kind of like the JavaScript version of what you just did. So JavaScript talking to native code through XPCOM. Um, a good deal of the Bankman JavaScript code deals with debugging UI, menus, um, and just uh, keeping state of the process and a uh, relatively small amount of it is really responsible for talking to the, um, the JSD itself, and modeling that data. So here we were building a toolkit in Eclipse and we thought, wouldn't, wouldn't it be fun if we could uh, use Eclipse's debugger interface? Eclipse already has a debugging UI, it already has uh, modeling for uh, debug data and events. Um, and we could leverage all the other things Eclipse has and, and make a nice uh, cohesive tool out of it. So um, the challenge is pretty much to tie Eclipse's debug APIs to Mozilla's. Um, and to date, the only users of the JSD has been, uh, the only user has been Venkman, uh, calling it from JavaScript. And we were told, you know, you guys can't do this. JSD's a uh, XP Connect and a JavaScript thing. It'll never work from Java. Well. We tried it and it basically worked. It, you know, some caveats I'll tell you about. So first I'll tell you what the JSD looks like. Um, here are three of the main interfaces. There are probably a dozen or more. Um, and these are XPCOM interfaces. Uh, most of the XPCOM interfaces start with NSI, which I guess is Netscape, I don't know. And JSD is the naming convention for JSD. JSDI debugger service is the main class. It lets you start up the debugger, set breakpoints, and it gets callbacks anytime anything interesting happens. Um, like execution hook will tell you when you, when you suspend. Um, and then when you do suspend, you can query uh, for uh, JSDI stack frame and value will give you your call stack and your variables. Um, and there are other details, but those are the major uh, points there. On the Eclipse side, and the picture is kind of hard to see, it's a little UML there. Um, I process, and now we're talking capital I, these are Eclipse Java interfaces. Um, I process basically gets tied to the browser. Uh, these are all interfaces that are provided in the core debug, you have to implement them. Um, debug target uh, is primarily a container for threads. Uh, there's only one thread in JavaScript, okay? Uh, I think debug targets where you set your breakpoints and thread is where you um, are responsible for keeping state, suspend, step, things like that. So those two classes kind of correspond to uh, debugging service from JSD. And then stack frame and variable obviously correlate to the other uh, JSD interfaces I mentioned. So how do we do it? We pretty much just tied the two together. We implemented those interfaces and it was a uh, each of these uh, implementations contains a reference to one of those JSD classes and uh, calling through the bridge. Uh, the arrows you see here, uh, iStackFrame requests a JSD iStackFrame proxy from Javier's code, makes calls to it. Um, the hooks are just the opposite. That's where we implement um, the hook with the Java class, register that, and then get calls back from XPCOM to Java, so two-way communication there. And, um, and you pretty much do that like you would in any, do I have a, an example running, let me see. I mean, here's my debug thread class, and you'll see it implements iThread, which is an Eclipse interface, but it also implements a whole bunch of JSD interfaces, like JSD execution hook, which is this 
generated stub will show you pretty much just has a bunch of constants in one method. And all I got to do, I mean, Java XPCOM hides a lot of the details for me. I just implement that method with the right signature and, and sure enough, I get, I get my calls back every time something executes. Oops, that's the wrong one. There we go. So one piece is to tie the two APIs together. Another piece is to implement the callbacks. And the third piece is to make sure we keep the states and events in sync between the two models. So that requires a bit of logic. Anytime I get a suspend, I got to go fire, a, uh, there's a method to fire an eclipse event that says, hey, I just hit a suspend. And I got to go grab all the stack frames and pretty much copy them over to my eclipse model. Um, and there's another trick we have to create pretty much a busy loop, a system, uh, uh, what's it called, system wait loop while you're in suspend. Um, we actually need to make sure we continue processing things like Windows drawing events or whatever the native platform is so your, 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 your browser gets repainted and things don't hang. So the JavaScript engine's frozen, but we, we have a, a loop that makes sure, to, make, make sure to process all this. Um, the method is escaping me. But win window paints, window messages, and wh whatever the uh, Eclipse has an abstraction for that, so it'll do the right thing on Linux too. Um, and we had to learn a little bit about threading. Uh, Mozilla, at least with the UI code, has a model where the, the code itself isn't thread safe. You, you have to there's a contract you have to agree to always execute it on a on a specific thread, and, um, and there is a, a utility called NSI supports proxies that's used extensively in, in Mozilla. Um, we tried using it over the bridge with mixed success. We ended up just um, doing the synchronization on the Java side. Everything, all those requests came from a single Java thread, maps through to a native thread, had the same end result, performed better. So we're happy with that. Um, and then there was another problem that uh, we had all this stuff working, but the on switch for the debugger uh, was actually one of the things that didn't work. Remember that asterisk? Um, Javier came up with a, a clever work around to use something called an observer. I really don't remember the details, but we could, we could hash that up if we need to. And um, so even though uh, JSD was never in really intended for use outside of JavaScript and it was never really tried, uh, we, we were pretty happy with the results. Um, but uh, we, we did discover there were some surprises. Um, a couple of the methods, like I mentioned, um, uh, may be wrapped in XPCOM, but they didn't, they, they weren't truly XPCOM, they, they cheated. Instead of returning a value, they'd punch it into the JavaScript call stack. I don't know if there was necessarily a reason for doing this all the time, or it's just old code. So some of those we were able to work around, some of them we're trying to fix. Um, also, the JSD does not directly expose the underlying XPCOM objects. Um, again, JavaScript used a trick to get at them through casting a pointer. We, we can't do that um, in, over the XPCOM bridge, over, uh, across the language boundary. So um, there are some things we're, we're not yet able to do, like get the window object, which I need to do for, for various reasons. Um, and the JSD is a very low level. Uh, it does not encapsulate things like stepping. You'd like there to be a method called step. And instead, there's uh, a callback that gets uh, executed for every uh, PC, every, every instruction uh, in JavaScript, um, where there may be many instructions per line. And you have to watch and see when it changed lines or when it did the equivalent of what you think is a step in or step out or step over. And I, I personally, I mean, we're doing pretty much the same thing Venkman is here. I'm personally a little uncomfortable with that logic that I wrote. I don't even know how well it works in Venkman. It'd be kind of nice if that logic were pushed closer to the JavaScript engine, um, the way we see it done in most other debugging uh, um, APIs. Uh, so again, sometimes it just doesn't feel very precise, both uh, from looking at the Venkman code and from our own experience. Uh, Venkman, I know, makes guesses in some places. Um, in terms of which function you're in and, and uh, what line you're at. So it'd be nice to see those things sharpened up a little bit in the, in the API. Um, here's a limitation that's both in Venkman and the API, uh, the JSD, which is that uh, you may have many different browser windows running. They're all kind of tied together through one process and, and one debugger. And uh, Venkman's modal, when you suspend, you've you've uh, locked up all your browsers and you can only really debug that browser uh, 
and you continue, and all the namespace for all of the files, all the variables are kind of rolled into one. A little complicated, uh, a little bit hard to, hard to work with, especially in Eclipse where uh, debugging uh, abstraction usually lets you deal with many things in parallel. We can't accomplish that today. Um, I actually need the window object to, to figure out which context I'm in, and I can't get to it. So that's something we'd like to see fixed, at least in our code. Um, another problem is that uh, whenever you have uh, an eval statement, uh, Mozilla gives you the context. If you say you have a syntax error or a breakpoint, Mozilla will point you at the place where the code was eval, where the eval statement took place. It will not give you a context within that code, and it's a bug. Um, and we're pursuing, it's a bug that's been in the system a very long time. We're lobbying to have it fixed. And uh, I know I've been doing a lot of work in Dojo, which leverages eval to, for pretty much all, all of its code uh, bootstrapping. So anytime you do anything, you go through this, and it makes uh, development almost impossible. Uh, there are workarounds, but uh, it would be nice if it were just fixed natively. Um, and there are details in that bug if anybody's interested, as usual in Bugzilla. Long, long discussion. Um, so some things on our to-do list. Um, if most of the things on this list seem possible given the current API support. Um, I'd like to try to finish them up, at which point I think our debugger will be pretty much on par with Bankman for, for function. And uh, I, not to say that there's anything inherently better about writing a debugger in Eclipse than in Zool, uh, except it is nice to know that we're reusing pieces from Eclipse that have been tested elsewhere, that are used elsewhere. Um, by the same token, I think by being a, an additional user to JSD, we will make JSD better and spur development in debuggers. Um, and of course, we have the benefit of, by virtue of being a, a part of the Eclipse uh, workbench, all the other tools and, and uh, the community, a greater community there to uh, operate with. So here are some of the things we think we might be able to do in the future. Um, uh, one of them uh, point goes to uh, Javier's prototype, which he just completed, like on the plane. So as soon as I get my hands on it, I want to see if we can run the debugger through it. Remote debugging and debugging Chrome would be very cool. Um, Eclipse also supports mixed call stacks. I personally haven't uh, tried this yet, but it, it seems like it ought to be possible to have a call stack that spans um, JavaScript and native code, maybe even JavaScript and server code. And you know, Microsoft uh, Visual Studio does things like this. It would be nice to be able to, to get that level of functionality in Eclipse and open source. Um, multiple uh, multitasking and debugging multiple targets, as I mentioned, and I don't have the Bugzilla reference, unfortunately, but um, something we'd like to see working. Hot swapping, this is a interpreted uh, scripting language. Why can't we just hot swap code? It should be very easy to do. And um, I say other modes of debugging, uh, most people really don't want to see JavaScript. Uh, people working with declarative markups and end users uh, to us, but developers working in AJAX toolkits or declarative markups aren't going to know what they're looking at if they break and they see dozens of lines of code within the toolkit. They want higher level abstractions. So XHR monitor and, and DOM inspector are very nice, but we want to know what else we can do to, to help uh, improve the development experience. And although it wasn't our initial uh, intent, um, both the uh, Zool community and folks working on Mozilla extensions um, would find this very useful and we've already received a lot of requests uh, and people are free to reuse these components, of course, and try to build IDEs around them and, and we'll try to, try to work with them to make our tools generic enough as needed to do that. So um, I haven't heard anything yet from any of you. Uh, I'd love to know if there's anything in particular that frustrates you about, about JavaScript uh, debugging, your, your experience with that. Um, for those of you that have used our tool I'd love to, and gotten it to work, I'd love to hear more about that too. Yeah? Is it a mixed Do we have a mixed language console? Okay, so, so do we, are we able to uh, display and dispatch both server logging and browser events and all messages and all those things? Right now we have, Eclipse comes with a, a view called console. 
Do I still have it running? Standard Eclipse console, I think, is standard out. And from that, you see um, mostly server output right now. We've redirected the output coming from the browser to a different view called JavaScript console by hooking the JavaScript console service. That's where most of the interesting stuff from Mozilla comes today. Um, if Mozilla does pipe anything to standard out, we don't hook it yet, but we probably could. I don't know, because uh, for Mozilla developers, I know standard out. I, from, I haven't done this for a long time, but I remember having the same problem as a dash console. You really want to get at that stuff. Uh, good point. Um, I have to say we haven't been focusing. I, I know you guys are all Mozilla developers, a lot of them here, and, and it's not where we've been focusing, but it's something we, we should look at. Yeah, it's a much. Sure. Oh, okay, so the equivalent of a printf, and besides alert, of course, which most people end up using. Um, various toolkits have different mechanisms for that. So Dojo has a dojo.debug, for example, which um, is right here. Um, you see what they did in the standard template is declared a floating panel. I, mean, I can even move it. And if I had a dojo debug statement, oh, dare I try this? Exactly. So right now, I'll try it again, see if, if it runs. If I put my debugging statement in there, good. I did a dojo.debug foo, and it shows up in this console. We were, actually, we were talking about this the other day, because this impacts everybody. We'd like to try to hook this Firebug. Firebug? One of those utilities does this today. Hook that console, instead of it appearing in the HTML screen, pipe it to a separate view, maybe the console, maybe a new view. Yes, we're working on that. Um, and using the magic of XPCOM, it should be possible. Yeah. Um, but in terms of logging, again, it's going to vary by toolkit. Um, we'd also like to do server-based logging, and Dojo has a package that we really haven't explored yet. I don't think too many people have, but we'd like to support um, yeah, server-based logging, maybe have a view for that as well, to be able to monitor one or more applications running remotely and see what's going on with them. And uh, I, I don't think I forgot to mention, but things like unit testing, automated testing, obviously very important too. Uh, yeah. You want persistent objects across? Inspect the heap, the, the JavaScript heap. Very good question. It's certainly not in the JSD. I don't know how to get to it, um, but it will be a wonderful point to raise with the Mozilla community. Say, give us an API, and I'll tell you one thing that is available is a profiler. That's another thing we could hook pretty easily. But uh, yeah, yeah, heap, heap objects and, and events um, and things like that would be very nice, just even memory usage. There, there are no APIs that I know of advertised to do that. So we, we would, I think, need to get somebody to write those and bake them into the browser for us. Um, how, how to get that done? I mean, it would be great to start a discussion on our news group to assemble that list. And then from there, maybe we can generate Bugzilla enhancement requests in Mozilla. And you know, you got to fight for them one at a time. But if they have merit, maybe it will happen. Yeah? Uh, no, I haven't. Uh, right now, it's just trying to get it working, trying to work out all the bugs. Uh, once, once I feel like it's at a decent level, then I'll try. I'll, I'll focus on performance. But uh, like I said, just getting it running has has been a has has been a big step. Um, so eventually, it's it's definitely on my list, uh, and I've tried to make it as. Um, as lightweight as possible, but there's definitely room for improvement. 
and in our particular application here, I mean, I can just say it doesn't feel like that's ever the hot spot for us, at least not yet, just by the nature of what we're doing. I'm uh, not to say that somebody else couldn't write an application that would demand yeah. much more performance. So, yeah. It seems like this almost begs testability. When, when you're trying to test some of this JavaScript on cross browsers with a relatively complicated application, you can instrument the server part of it, but with this, you can also instrument the client. Exactly. So, yeah, it goes to our testability and, and things that. I conveniently forgot to put it in the presentation, but uh, unit test was one, like JS unit, but also to be able to drive the DOM API, so that would be a great way to write a test, almost like in a, a grease monkey approach. It's combined with Eclipse monkey. Maybe you put the two together. I, I, I don't know. It's very interesting. And uh, also, uh, we toyed with the idea of like side-by-side uh, -side comparison, visual inspection, to make sure that different browsers behave well. Yeah, those are all, all great ideas. Tomcat, yeah. yeah. Why can't you just run it on the file system? We deployed to Tomcat, and um, why can't we run it on the file system? It varies by toolkit. Uh, Zimbra, the way it's built, actually has a dependency, not just on the server, but, well, the only one they've implemented is JSP, um, hence the, the Tomcat dependency. Um, and to make things a little more complicated, WTP that we leverage to do this only supports J2EE servers today. Um, Tomcat, BEA, WebSphere. No reason why they can't support Apache. In fact, we're working on that. But as far as just deploying straight from the file system, um, you can type into this browser a, a file, a file colon URL and, and see it embedded and use most of these tools. Um, I believe you, you can manually plug one of those into the browser as well. We could probably uh, make a right-click launcher that, that runs it locally. I don't think there's anything restricting us from doing that. Um, you see, if I go to uh, make a new Mozilla application, I can either point at a project or I can just type in a, a straight URL with a file colon. So it's possible maybe we should just build more uh, intuitive UI into doing that. Yeah. Okay, one more. So Oh, from within Zool? Yes. So no, that, I, that's, um, I think that's actually, I'm not too familiar with it, but uh, that's part of uh, what's being done to make Python be on the same level as JavaScript inside Zool. Uh, to be another scripting language that you can use to, to do the actual actions in Zool. But no, that we're not approaching that. Uh, we're not trying to do Java like that. And I don't think anyone has even suggested it or asked for it. Uh, I think most people would be looking at it from a, uh, performance point of view and from requiring a JVM point of view and they would be hesitant. But uh, if there's enough support for it, if enough people request it, I don't see why we couldn't do that. Um, but the, I don't think anyone mentioned it. There are Java implementations of Zool that don't run in Mozilla. Luxor, perhaps, I um, for what that's worth. But to me, it's not the same Zool. If you're, it's not the right ones to run everywhere. Not only is the language different, but all the bindings are different, the tags are different. So I don't know if that's gone anywhere. I haven't really looked at that for almost a year. Yeah. Any thought on doing the same for server-side JavaScript, like debugging in Rhino? I know Rhino has a debugger, but it's very rudimentary. I want to say, John, Ponzo in the back. <laughs> do we do that? Debugging server-side JavaScript today? Okay, this is, you could debug JavaScript in a JSP in mind, but not, not, not server-side JavaScript. So um, we've started on the client. Uh, we do need, obviously, more server-side integration, both 
on the server and spanning client and server, and that's just stuff we haven't gotten to yet. Yeah. Okay. Great. To, to what? I'm sorry. Yes, yes. So SWAT SWIT, yeah. Mm -hmm. with the, with SWAT SWIT, Uh, not sure I understand the question, but you want you want to write to to the SWIT APIs and have it run in AJAX. Well, you can have designer applications that you can visually lay out. Yeah. Your widgets, and you know the target for that is typically a, a full Java application. But if you're laying out a set of widgets, um, why not just implement them as something that gets AJAX? Yeah, I thought there was already a uh, I thought there was already somebody out there doing that. I don't remember the name, but it was something like that that you wrote to SWT and it just converted it to JavaScript on the back end. Um, I tried it out once, it was okay, but I haven't looked at it since. Um, so there is somebody doing it. We just haven't taken a look at it. There are a wide variety of approaches we've seen. Uh, you know, a lot of the, 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 the hot Ajax technologies, of course, being JavaScript driven, great for web developers. There are other companies. Um, ICE, the people do the ICE browser is one. They're trying to drive everything from JSF, from Java. And there are various other projects, so open source and closed, to try to drive development from Java. So, you know, we're not taking a stand for or against them. But, yeah, I mean, this tool gets primarily about JavaScript in, in the browser on the client. And to the extent that any of the pieces are useful, you know, they're out there, they're in open source, they could be reused. So. Okay, last question. As you, the first issue you addressed was the difficulty in installing it. So yeah. what's the state of art? Do you have a one install that will just unzip and run? And yeah, we should. We should have just given up and given out a zip or, or an image or something. We were talking about that earlier. Yeah, I'm getting a thumbs up from the back of the room. Um, right now, we're still trying to get things to work in the Eclipse Update site. And frankly, uh, it, it got a lot better until the website it was deployed on disappeared. Uh, <laughs> IBM AlphaWorks, it was there. I think we're trying to bring the website back. Um, it was mo more a matter of getting the install steps right because some of it's still manual um, and getting all the prereqs exactly right because although we do pull in lots of pieces, there are still some you have to pull in yourself. You have to install Clips on your machine. It has to be the right version. You have to install the right version of Zool Runner manually. And you know if you get all that right, you have to be connected to a network. We forgot to mention that to people, and a lot of them said, you know, why didn't this work? Isn't everybody connected to a network, right? So, you know, once we, we got all those, we, we got a better set of instructions. I think we actually had a reasonable uh, success uh, uh, on, on the, uh, the list. So I would encourage those of you who, who haven't to uh, try again in a couple days when that website comes back. If you go to the Eclipse site, you will see our CVS tree. You might even see a build which requires even more intervention. It's a nightly build. It's not stable. AlphaWorks is going to be the best place to go if you want to play with this technology. So, and again, uh, go to the news group if you have questions for us. Uh, we try to monitor it frequently, and we would encourage your feedback and participation. So, thank you very much. Thanks.